The character means so much to me and it's been five years now and I've, quite rightly, um, otherwise I probably shouldn't deserve to wear the, the cape, but I, I never gave up hope. And it's amazing to be here now uh, talking about it again. Um, there is such a bright future ahead for the character and I'm so excited to tell a story with a, an enormously joyful Superman. We need a Superman movie. For years, Warner Brothers and DC have been sidelining the character in film, relegating him to faceless cameos or quick mentions or... Oh God. And in an era where cynicism and hate speech is rising, I've always felt that that was a massive mistake. And so when it was announced that Henry Cavill was going to be returning as the Big Blue Boy Scout, with a sequel to Man of Steel being developed under a new DC Studios led by James Gunn, I couldn't help but feel... Hopeful. A few years ago, I pitched Clark, an alternate smaller scale movie that was inspired by All-Star Superman and followed Tom Hanks cast as an older Clark Kent. I'm still pretty happy with that video and I'm really happy with the response that I've gotten to it, but I've always wanted to tackle a Henry Cavill led Superman movie and talk about the ways that you can make what I think is a definitive Superman story work within that universe. Somewhere between the Richard Donner movies and Man of Steel is a perfect balance that can remind the world how important the character really is when we need him most. And I think the title of the movie should reflect that while still making the connections clear. Tell the world that this is the Superman story that it needs and what the legendary character fights for. And so, to no one's surprise, probably, since it seems like the obvious pick, here's my pitch for Man of Tomorrow. We open in Metropolis. We see a 10-year-old girl who just moved to the city, Lan Shin Lee, walking through the streets with her parents and her brother. There's a loud boom, and a man made entirely out of metal leaps through the air and lands in the middle of the street. The metal man begins to wreak havoc, and Lan Shin gets separated from her family during the chaos. The man sends a car flying through the air towards Lan Shin. She braces to get crushed, but it never comes. She looks to see the car floating in the air, being held up by something, by someone. Superman holds the car over his head. He looks at the girl and smiles. Don't be scared. It's going to be okay. I'm here. Lanshin opens her eyes. She sits alone in an empty, cold, dark room. Something is grafted onto her, an alien plant. Its vines wrap around the young girl, all around her chest and neck, the black mercy. There's a loud, booming voice in the darkness. He's not coming to save you. Soon you will break. Her captor removes the Black Mercy from Lanshin's chest. The girl falls to the ground, clutching something in her hand. A small, makeshift toy of a man with a red S on his chest. Soon, you will crush your hope. With the character of Superman, there's always a desire to make things bigger and badder, always having the fate of the entire planet at stake. But I think there's an element to Superman's character that tends to get forgotten about in film. Every superhero nowadays goes on some big, grand, world-saving adventure, even so-called villains and anti-heroes. So to have Superman do the same thing is kind of repetitive. And I think what makes a real hero is something smaller, something deep within your heart that you can't control or reason with. It's easy to save the world. It's a lot harder, impossible even to drop everything, risk losing it all for one single person. We cut to Clark and we catch up with him as he goes about his everyday life. We follow him as he does the traditional Superman thing that we haven't seen in a while, stopping bank robberies, saving cats out of trees, all while stopping and caring for the people that he helps. When it was announced that a sequel to Man of Steel was being developed, there was a lot of discussion about who should direct it. Some want Snyder to come back and I wouldn't be opposed if he was partnered with the right screenwriter. I think Snyder directed the hell out of Man of Steel, but the script really held him back. Some say Matthew Vaughn or Joseph Kaczynski of Top Gun Maverick, and I don't want to get too into that right now because it's going to age this video pretty bad, but I do think that whoever directs this movie needs to have a clear and passionate love Love for the character of Superman. I've been spoiled this year with the Batman. It's now officially one of my favorite superhero movies ever made, and 100% of that comes down to Matt Reeves as a director. Reeves loves the character of Batman, and poured every ounce of that love and heart into his vision and his story, and you can feel all of that in the final product. And I think Superman deserves no less than that. We established that it's been five years since the events of Snyder's Justice League, because why would why would we use the other one? Clark and Lois have been happily married, and Lois is now six months pregnant with their first child. Clark chose to retire the black suit. It reminded him too much of the time when he was gone and when the world thought he was dead, and he doesn't want to relive that. So he's donned his red and blue once again to try and rebuild that symbol of hope. Not in death, but in life. While Clark is out on patrol, he hears a high-pitched ringing in his ear. Amanda Waller sending out a signal that only his super hearing and some dogs can pick up. She and him have been loosely working together ever since he came back to life. He doesn't like it, he hates it, honestly. But she tells him where trouble is if he's unable to get there first. Natural disasters, nuclear missiles, that sort of thing. Lately, they've been working to put a stop to inner gang and their affairs. But Clark can tell that this time, something's different. There's been a kidnapping. 
We cut to a home in Metropolis, flooded with Argus agents and police officers. Superman arrives at the scene to see the chaos. Even Amanda Waller herself is there. She tells Superman that the victim's name is Lan Shin Lee, a young girl who lived with her brother and her parents. Superman's heart drops. He knows that name. He remembers her. About a year ago, he saved her during his first fight with Metallo. He can't believe it. Superman walks through Lanshin's bedroom, where she was taken. The walls are adorned with Superman posters and memorabilia. Waller tells Superman that she was abducted late last night. They think it's in her gang, but they don't know for sure. The only thing they do know is that the girl only grabbed one thing as she was being taken. A small toy that her mother made for her when she was a child. Of Superman. Waller is hoping Superman can figure out what Inner Gang is planning, and if there are any clues to their leaders. Lanshin's brother Tommy saw what happened, but Amanda Waller, in her infinite kindness and empathy, hasn't been able to get him to talk. That was a joke. That was a that was a joke. Clark has everyone in the room leave so he can talk to Tommy alone. He comforts the boy, asking him calmly what happened to his sister, where she was taken. Tommy points up, up in the sky. Superman Up in the Sky by Tom King and Andy Kubert is one of my favorite Superman comics ever made. In fact, a lot of times I recommend it to newer readers before something like Grant Morrison's All-Star because of how clearly it demonstrates why Superman is so special before All-Star goes and deconstructs that. And I've always thought that the core concept of Superman going on a quest to save one person is something that would work so well for a movie. It's a clear goal that anyone with a heart can understand and it pretty easily dismantles the Superman is boring because he's invincible argument. The girl was taken deep into space, far beyond the reaches that any satellite or monitoring system could track. Somewhere in the vast, infinite void that is the universe, there's a girl, scared and alone, waiting for Superman to come save her. Waller sees the look on Superman's face and orders him to stay. If it were just a run-of-the-mill kidnapping, he would be allowed, but this? She asks him if he even comprehends the vastness that is the known universe. They have nothing to go off of, no clues, no direction to even pursue. He could be gone for months, years. It would be impossible to find her, even for him. She tells him that he can't put the planet in jeopardy all because of one little girl. My biggest issue with Black Adam... Okay, now my biggest issue, but one of my issues with Black Adam was that the credit scene made it seem like Superman is working for the US government and is taking orders from Amanda Waller. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that Amanda Waller isn't very nice. That is just a mean lady. Now, I do like the idea of Waller being the kind of DC equivalent of what Marvel did with Nick Fury, having her hands on all the pies and showing up in different cameos to connect this otherwise incredibly varied universe. But I think that only works if you continue to frame her as a mean lady. Amanda Waller in all other media is supposed to be a representation of everything that's wrong with the military and the government. Even the disaster that is 2016 Suicide Squad got that right. So to have Superman seemingly take orders from her or anyone in the military that he doesn't agree with just feels wrong. Superman's story should never be propaganda for the military, which is why I'm happy that James Gunn is part of this process. If we can capture even a sliver of what he did with the Suicide Squad, then I'll be happy. Because that movie is great. I love that movie so much. And so I would want this movie to make clear that Superman doesn't work for the government. He's not some patsy or weapon that they can throw around, and no matter how hard they might try, they'll never stop him from doing what's right. Waller tells Superman that no matter how strong he is, even he can't save everyone. And Clark pauses. But what if I can save her? Superman sits on a rooftop, overlooking the bay that connects Metropolis to Gotham. A shadow drops down from above. Batman, the Dark Knight. Clark looks at Batman without a word. There is a pause, and Batman holds up a bag of takeout food. Clark and Bruce talk while they eat. The two, who started as enemies during the darkest times of both of their lives, have become not only allies, but close friends. And Clark trusts Bruce's opinion more than almost anyone. Batman and Superman's friendship is incredibly important to both of the characters, and there's a common misconception that the two must hate each other or something, probably because DC keeps making them fight all the time. When in reality, the two's relationship and friendship is one of the best in comics. Like everyone he meets, Clark inspires Bruce, encourages him to be the best person he can be, and Bruce, in turn, does the same for Clark. It's a relationship that Snyder was beginning to explore but I think now it's time we set that record straight. Clark tells Bruce about Lanshin and her kidnapping. He fully expects Bruce to tell him to stay. That the world needs a Superman. That Lois needs Clark. His son is going to be born in three months, and he knows he can't miss that. And it's not worth risking the safety of humanity just for one person. But he knows that this girl is out there, somewhere, counting on him. And he can't let her down. Bruce stops him and tells him he should go. Yes, it's impossible. Finding one girl in the vast infinity of the universe and making it home in three months, with no leads, no clues, nothing to follow, with no idea how long it could take or how dangerous it would be. But if there's anyone who can do it, anyone who can achieve the impossible, it's Superman. Clark and Lois sit on Kent Farm at sunset, looking up at the sky. 
He asked her to cover for him at the planet, but she says she's already ahead of him. She used the same excuse for when he died, said he was deep undercover on a story about inner gang, which isn't technically wrong. He has three months. That's when their son is due. Three months to find Lanshin, three months to come home, three months until he's a father. Leaving Lois is the one thing he's the most worried about. He knows she's strong, stronger than anybody, but he has no clue how long he'll be gone for, what could happen to her or the baby while he's gone. But Lois is supportive of him finding Lanshin. Martha agreed to help Lois with anything and everything involving the pregnancy, and Bruce handpicked a team of scientists that they trust to make sure everything goes smoothly and safely. She knows Clark has to do this. She doesn't like it, it feels like she just got him back, but she knows it's what's right and that's what he has to do. Clark smiles and kisses Lois goodbye. The ground trembles beneath them and Superman launches upwards into the sky. As Superman is flying through space, he sees a spaceship that's about to explode. An alien is flying around the distressed ship, evacuating people to a nearby craft. The alien is glowing, creating constructs out of a strange green light that Clark has never seen before. Clark rushes in to help the ship and evacuate the passengers before it explodes. And we get an action scene that's reminiscent of the oil rig scene from the first movie, only this time Clark sticks around for the aftermath. The alien says his name is Tomar Ray of the Green Lantern Corps, and that the ship was a civilian transport from the United Planets that was attacked. He thanks Superman for his help, saying he saved a lot of lives today, and he asks what Earth's protect Sector is doing so far away from his sector. Clark tells Green Lantern about Lan Shin and his quest to save her, and he asks about any potential leads he could follow. Tomar Ray says that neither he nor any of the other Lanterns have heard anything about an Earth girl being captured. He warns Superman that this mission that he's on, it's impossible, even for him. But still, Clark knows he has to. Lan Shin needs him. We cut to Lan Shin in her prison cell, as the Black Mercy begins to take hold of her once again. She's starting to lose track of how long she's been there, at least three weeks. Every day, her captors put her under its influence, a plant that shows the host their heart's greatest desire before they rip it away from her again in an effort to torture her psyche, a dark and twisted attempt to destroy the hope of this little girl. She envisions herself back home as she goes to school. She walks through the halls before she starts to get harassed by one of her classmates, Chuck Riggs. The boy calls her names, insults her, makes her life hell because of the way she's dressed, the way she talks, the color of her skin. The hate comes from a place of ignorance and self-loathing and a cycle of violence within his family, but still, it's hate all the same. For anyone who doesn't know, the character of Lanshin Lee is from the fantastic Superman Smashes the Clan by Jean Lu and Yang and Guru Hero. It's an amazing comic, one of my favorites of the past decade. Yang is able to weave this story that's wholesome fun and camp with a deeply personal and real look at racism in America. He parallels Superman's identity as an alien refugee to his own life growing up Chinese, and it's really just such a fantastic story that I can't recommend enough. The story is pretty deep rooted in its setting of the 1940s since it was based off one of the old radio serials at the time, but its messages and its subject matter is tragically all too relevant today. Lanshin tries to ignore Chuck tries to step aside and let him pass her by, but he won't leave her alone. That's when the wall beside them explodes and Superman appears, here to save her. Clark spending an entire movie out in space unfortunately loses out on some of the iconography and imagery of the character on Earth. Up in the Sky combats this by making the book a series of vignettes that showcase what make the character special, including different flashbacks and one-off stories. And while that exact structure can't be directly adapted to film, we can come close. Man of Steel used a non-linear structure to show Clark's childhood, and we can do something similar when it comes to this space odyssey. Wait, hang on, not that one. Throughout the movie, the Black Mercy gives Lanshin her heart's desire, for Superman to come save her. Not just from her current imprisonment or from villains destroying Metropolis, but from things that she struggles with on a daily basis back home. I think we can distinguish these visions from reality by having Cavill wearing a version of the Fleischer Superman suit, which is personally my favorite look for the character. And so we have these big, bombastic action scenes out in space, followed by smaller moments in Lanshin's visions. Superman is at his best when you juxtapose the fantastical with calm, quiet kindness. Despite a lot of the story taking place in deep space like this, I really can't let Lois Lane get forgotten about and relegated to just the pregnant woman. Amy Adams has always been fantastic casting, and I can't help but feel like she hasn't been able to get fully what she wanted out of this role. She was great in Man of Steel, but in Batman v Superman she was essentially just a plot device to have the two characters clash, and in Justice League she spent essentially the whole movie in mourning. Lois Lane is one of the strongest and most important women in all of comics, and I think it's time we gave her agency again. We can have her try and deal with the ramifications of Superman leaving and show that you can still be a badass girl boss while six months pregnant. After Superman left the planet, a lot of people in Metropolis became angry, frustrated, feeling like they're being ignored and forgotten about. And one man sees this panic, sees this deep-rooted insecurity, and he chooses to take advantage of it. Lex Luthor. In the time between Justice League, Lex has bribed off enough judges and changed his act just enough to fix his image. No longer is he the sociopathic Mark Zuckerberg commentary that he was in the past. Now he's convinced a portion of Metropolis that he's a genius, a visionary, the one person who could achieve the impossible and make humanity accomplish wonders. When in reality, he's deeply flawed and narcissistic, and his success Success relies solely on getting help from his daddy's emerald mine. Wait, did I say emerald mine? I meant, uh...
kryptonite mine. If it's too unrealistic to have Eisenberg's version of the character fix his reputation like that, then that's fair. And we can lean on the backup plan that it's Lex Luthor Sr. coming into the picture because they've kind of implied that it's Lex Luthor Jr. But I think Jesse is a super talented actor and he can totally pull Lex off so long as he's given the right material to work with. And also if he's not too busy with Now You See Me 3, Now You 3 Me. Lex is taking advantage of Superman being gone, making more public outings, speeches, talk shows, news reports, all to push an anti-Superman agenda. He particularly likes going on the show Good Grief with G. Gordon Godfrey, which really lets him speak his mind to the people of Metropolis. One day, Lois is hate watching the show when she sees that Lex is announcing that he's proposing a privately owned police force, using LexCorp tech to protect the city and replace Superman while he's gone. If no one else is going to help the people on the ground like Superman is supposed to, then Lex says he'll step up to the plate. Lois starts researching Lex's proposal more in depth. Not only would there be dozens, if not hundreds, of superpowered officers roaming the streets who answer to nobody but Lex Luthor, but a clause in his proposal would also criminalize any and all superpowered individuals in the city. So throughout the movie, we cut back to Earth to see Lois attempting to stop Lex from spreading this propaganda and finding evidence to put a stop to his proposal. And who better to help Lois on this endeavor than my guy, my man, the most important character in all of Superman media, the one person that defines what Superman represents better than anybody, Jimmy motherfucking Olsen. No, not that guy. We don't talk about that guy. Jimmy as a character is incredibly important to Superman mythos and is worthy of an entire video all on his own. And I think the biggest failing of this universe has been that he wasn't a part of it. Again, we don't talk about that. We can bring the Jimmy in by saying he's a real photographer who starts working at the planet and the CIA guy was just using the name as a cover. Let me know down in the comments if you have any ideas for fan casting for Jimmy, by the way, because uh, this is a platform that relies entirely on engagement and I need more of it. We cut back to Clark in space. Toma Ray says that Superman's best option is to go to the planet Karna. If there's any intergalactic criminal activity happening under the Guardian's nose, it will go through there. Karna is a small but beautiful planet. Plant life and technology make the skyline gleam with sunlight, but that's where the beauty ends. For generations, the planet has been ruled by the Gordanians, colonizers, career criminals, who came to the planet and stealing it from the people that lived there before. The Gordanians live in luxury, with technology and space travel bought by the wealth of crime and the planet's resources sources, while the Carnians live in poverty and slavery. Clark arrives at Karna and becomes enraged when he learns what's happening. The disrespect of life and basic fundamental values. He comes across a small rebel group who are overpowered and outnumbered by the Gordanian military, and when they ask for his help, without a moment's hesitation, Superman agrees to aid their cause. Superman, as far back as his first ever appearance, has always been the champion of the oppressed. He was created by two brilliant Jewish men in the midst of the darkest time in human history in an attempt to invoke hope and optimism for those who needed it. Fundamentally, he's a refugee from another world that fights for human rights against an evil billionaire, and I think it's time that the movies make that abundantly clear. For days on end, Superman helps to liberate the Carnians, pressuring the Gordanians to free the enslaved and leave the planet. The leader is stubborn with pride and tries to fight back, but eventually Superman creates enough of a disturbance and aids the revolution just enough that the Carnians are able to break their chains and take down their oppressors. Honestly, I say we hammer home the Moses allegories just as much as the other movies hammer home the Jesus stuff, cause, you know. That's what he's supposed to be. Superman questions the Gordanian leader, asking about an Earth girl that was kidnapped. The leader is terrified, completely unwilling to give the name for fear of what might happen to him. Superman eventually gets him to confess. The leader says the name and Clark goes silent. We cut back to Lan Shin in her prison cell as a massive hulking figure steps out of the darkness, made of evil, infinite and forever dark side. Superman has countless different villains that we've never seen on the big screen, compared to Darkseid, who we've seen kind of a lot lately. And maybe one day I'll make a separate video pitching a Brainiac movie, or a Mongol movie, or a mix of Spitlick movie. But for this story and the themes that I want to convey, nobody truly leaves that same impact and represents the same ideals as the Lord of Apocalypse himself. And despite having been in a lot of media lately, I don't think much really comprehends his scope. Darkseid is more than just DC's Thanos, and he does more than just conquer planets. He's a character with a level of nuance that tends to get forgotten about. He's a massive Justice League level threat, so for Superman to face him alone is impossible. In the same way that Superman is defined by ideals that extend far beyond the character himself, so is Darkseid. He's a force of nature, darkness, anti-life, unending hate, existing infinitely throughout the multiverse, only projecting himself on this plane of existence through an avatar, the personification embodiment of all things that Superman opposes, the unstoppable force that is fascism and hate, the direct opposition to hope, unyielding, unwavering evil. And so what happens when that unstoppable force meets the immovable object that is Superman, that is hope? 
After the events of Snyder's Justice League, Darkseid went to work on his invasion of Earth to obtain the anti-life equation. Of course, that invasion is a full Justice League level threat and I don't want to take that possibility away, so we established that Darkseid is still planning his invasion. He saw what the Justice League did to his uncle and he knows he has to be prepared. He sees that hope is Superman's greatest asset, and for his entire existence he's known that hope is the one thing that's powerful enough to stand in his way. He knows he can't conquer Earth with the Kryptonian at full strength, and so he has to break him before the invasion even begins. And so Darkseid opened a boom tube to Earth Earth and picked a girl at random, a girl that the world would forget about, that nobody would miss, and if they did, they wouldn't be able to find her. And so Darkseid tortures this girl psychologically, giving her hope and then ripping it away day in and day out to prove to Superman that humans are corrupt and flawed at their core, that hope can be broken, and Superman ideologically is flawed a contradiction. Darkseid gets word that Superman is on his way and that he knows he kidnapped the girl, but Darkseid isn't worried. He sends a message out to someone who has a reputation for cleaning up messes. A mercenary. Someone strong enough to face off against the Man of Steel. Lobo. I fucking love Lobo. He's so much fun and he's so cool and he's so silly. He's fucking sick. There's a rumor going around that Jason Momoa is going to play him in something on top of playing Aquaman, which I think is a really, really fun idea. He's this great parody of 90s Edge and I think he'd be great to have in the story. Superman is tracking where Darkseid took Lan Shin when he comes across Lobo in space. Lobo calls out to Superman, saying that he's a medical scout for the United Planets. There's an abandoned ship not too far from here and he needs help looking for survivors. Superman sees this man who looks like this, and figures he doesn't look like a medic. But at this point, he's seen so many different alien races and cultures, who is he to judge? And so he agrees to help Lobo. Lobo takes Clark to an abandoned ship that's in the orbit of a red sun. It's far enough away to not affect Clark too much, but still he's wary. The two of them make their way inside, looking for any sign of survivors, but they're not able to find anything. That's when Clark opens up the hatch to see what the ship was carrying, a stash of glowing green rocks. The radiation from the kryptonite hits Clark like a brick wall. He starts to feel nauseous, his limbs grow weak, and his knees buckle beneath him as he tries not to vomit. Lobo Lobo laughs. He says he knew he wouldn't be able to take on a Kryptonian at full strength, but this made it almost too easy. Lobo slams a punch at Superman, sending him flying into the vacuum of space towards the red sun. He grows weaker and weaker, and his eyes grow heavy as he loses consciousness. No. She still needs me. I'm sorry. Lois and Jimmy's plotline has all been leading to Lois giving a speech at Metropolis City Hall. This meeting, which was scheduled by Lex himself, will determine the fate of his private army, with counselors voting to decide whether or not to go forward with this proposal. For the entire movie, Lois and Jimmy have been gathering evidence and preparing a speech to present it for this very meeting. Lois has a few days until her due date, and she's confident that with the evidence she gathered, she'll be able to stand in the way of Lex's plan to control the city. But then, right before Lois is about to speak, the unthinkable happens. Her water breaks. The baby is early. Darkseid enters Lanshin's cell. For months, he's tried tormenting her with the Black Mercy, tried to crush her hope and understand why humans are this way. But still she resists. Still she fights against him and believes that Superman can save her. There's still that one little spark that he can't seem to snuff out. That's when he sees the doll in her clutches. The small, insignificant toy with the cape and the red S on its chest, falling apart with years of love but still intact. Of course. Darkseid grabs the doll from the girl. She screams and fights back, but is overpowered by the Lord of Apocalypse. He crushes the doll in his fist, turning it to ash. Darkseid leaves Lynchin alone in her cell, and the girl begins to cry. As this is happening, we see Lois as she starts to go into labor. The pain starts to become immense. She looks at Lex, who scheduled this meeting for this exact time and date, as he's unable to keep the smug grin off of his face. He planned this. She doesn't know how, she doesn't even want to think about how, but the creep must have known all along this would happen. Superman drifts through the vast emptiness of the universe unconscious, and yet, he hears a sound. Somehow, through the vacuum of space, the sound still travels. Galaxies away, through thousands of nebulas and solar systems, is the sound of a young girl crying for Superman to save her. Superman slowly opens his eyes as he hears her cries. It's faint, it's distant, but it's there. It's her. He knows it. In the blink of an eye, Superman blasts off through space, flying toward the sound faster than he's ever flown before. Across the universe, through hundreds of galaxies, thousands of solar systems, through a thousand yellow suns. We cut back to Lois, still at City Hall. Jimmy tells her she has to get to a hospital, but this is too important. There's still some time. Lois can't have her son born into a world controlled by Lex Luthor. And so she begins her presentation. Through the worst pain imaginable and through gritted teeth, she gives her speech and presents her evidence. The pain begins to become unbearable, and Lois decides to forget the note cards, forget the evidence, and speak from her heart about Superman and about why he left to go save Lan Shin. Not because he doesn't care about the people of Metropolis like so many people are scared of, 
the exact opposite. Superman cares about the people of Earth more than anybody. His love for humanity knows no limits. Earth is his home, and it forever will be. And he will stop at nothing to make sure that each and every single person on it is safe. As Superman flies, he passes by the people he's met along the way. Tomar Ray, the Green Lantern, the headquarters of the United Planets, the freed people of Karna, even Lobo. Every single one of them looks up at the sky to see him. A streak across the stars, like a comet, glowing bright red and blue. After Lois's speech, the counselors are silent. They all look at each other as she waits anxiously at the podium and unanimously vote against Lex's proposal. Lex is fuming, saying something like this is impossible. But we all know, if there's anyone who can achieve the impossible, it's Lois Lane. Lois is rushed out of City Hall to her private hospital. She lays on a bed as she's surrounded by doctors, scientists, and technicians. She's in so much pain, terrified. It was dangerous for her to wait. She should have gotten there sooner. The baby's going to be fine, but she can't wait any longer. But Clark is nowhere to be found. We cut back to Lanshin in her prison cell, crying. In the distance, she hears a sound. The wall explodes, and a man stands before her. Silhouetted against the light, his cape blows in the wind, the symbol on his chest warm and inviting, shining brighter than any sun. Don't be scared. It's going to be okay. A hand is placed on Lois' shoulder. I'm here. Lois looks up to see him, her husband, the father of her child, Clark Kent. He made it. She doesn't know how, but he made it. He achieved the impossible. One of my favorite stories from Up in the Sky is Superman's race with the Flash. In the comics, the two of them race all the time for charity. The Flash, of course, is the fastest man alive, able to move so fast that he can break barriers and travel through time. Superman is fast, but nowhere near that level. And so, by all means and logic, shouldn't be able to outrun him. It's impossible. During this specific race, however, Superman is contacted by Lex Luthor. Lex tells Clark that if Superman wins this race, he would donate an extra billion dollars to charity. Clark is already exhausted, laps behind Barry, and has no way of catching up. Lex knows this and just wants to torment Superman in any way he can. He's going to lose. But Clark knows he wouldn't be the only one losing. All of those charities, all of the good that a billion dollars would do for the world. And so Superman runs. He runs harder and faster until he's more exhausted and in pain than he's ever been. And Superman wins. It's impossible to be faster than the fastest man alive. But so is everything Superman does. Superman himself is a walking contradiction. He achieves the impossible every day. It's how he's able to fly, leap tall buildings, move faster than a speeding bullet, find one girl in the infinite, empty void of the universe. Impossible. But Superman, if it means doing the right thing, helping people, can always achieve the impossible. Just moments earlier, Superman grabs a hold of Lanshin and hugs her. He found her. She's safe. That's when he arrives. Dark side. Superman stands in front of Lanshin, the only thing between her and the unstoppable force that is his evil. His body supercharged with the solar energy of a thousand suns. Dark side scoffs at Superman, says that he found the girl, but he came alone. He's still just one man, and one man's hope means nothing in the grand scope of the universe. At that moment, thousands and thousands of dots fill the sky above them. At first, they seem like stars, but on closer look, it's more than that. United Planet starships, the Green Lantern Corps, the Carnians using the technology of their former oppressors, even Lobo himself. Everybody that Clark met on his journey. Each and every single one of them looked up in the sky to see Superman, see him fulfilling this impossible quest, and they joined him. They joined him to save one girl. Darkseid, with all of his power and his might, sends a punch at Superman. There's a massive shockwave as the force of infinite hatred, unyielding evil, is sent upon the Man of Steel in a fraction of a second. Everything goes quiet. The dust clears, and Superman remains unchanged, unwavering. If you look at the state of the world right now, and the state of everything from even the past few years, everywhere you look, you will see hate. You see anger and violence and discrimination uh, in the forms of racism or homophobia, anti-Semitism, misogyny, xenophobia, transphobia. The list goes on and on and on. All forms of hate and oppression seem to fill every aspect of the media in our lives and the people that perpetrate this hate, the people that benefit from the division and the oppression and the squashing of ideas, they want you to believe that they're unstoppable. With their platforms and their soapboxes, they try to convince you that they're an impossible force and you should move aside for them or else get crushed under their weight. But that's simply not the case. 
and I need you to know this. The power of hate and oppression and fascism is meaningless in the face of love, kindness, and hope. The love of your fellow neighbor, the kindness to do what others claim is impossible, the hope that there can be a better future, the unstoppable force is powerless against an immovable object. There's one thing you need to understand, Dark Side. No matter what you throw at me, no matter how hard you hit me, try to break me, torment me and my people, try to destroy our hope, you will always be nothing more than a bully. And we will never move for the likes of you. Dark Side stands in silence. The seemingly infinite force of evil, fascism and hate unending, stopped dead in its tracks, rendered powerless by Superman, rendered powerless by hope. The two of them stare each other down, and without a word, a portal behind Darkseid opens as he creates a boom tube back to Earth. He tells Superman to get out of his sight. This isn't the end, but he's made his point. We cut back to Earth some time later. Lan Shin is back home and returns back to school. The bully, Chuck Riggs, despite everything, still harasses her, still calls her names, but she doesn't run. She doesn't hide. She stands tall, just as Superman would, and herself becomes the immovable object. We see she's wearing a jacket now, a red one, with a large yellow symbol on the back of it. The symbol that means hope, shining brighter than the sun. We see Superman as he flies through the sky, holding baby Jonathan Kent in his arms. Forever, Superman will always stand for something. No matter how many bullies try to knock him down, tell him he can't, he still stands tall. No matter how unstoppable the force, no matter how impossible it may seem, Superman will always stand for truth, justice, and a better Now, we could very well end the movie there, and realistically, we probably should because the movie's over, but we all know that every attempt at a cinematic universe needs a credit scene to set up future sequels and spinoffs, and we, the audience, are forced to wait until the absolute very end to just get a snippet of what's to come. And so while we wait, this video has been brought to you by Skillshare. Superman as a character is all about helping us to see our own potential and rise up to what we're fully capable of. And Skillshare, with its wide variety of courses and classes to help you engage with your passions, is no different. If you are following this channel or paid attention during this video, you might have noticed that I've been using Blender more and more often. Blender is super powerful, but it's really complicated and it's really overwhelming because of how much you can do. So Kwan Shaban's class, Blender 3D, The 10 Things I Wish I Knew Sooner, Series 4, has made a huge impact on what I'm able to achieve. Look, I was even able to make this. Whether or not I should be proud of it, that's for you to decide. Make now the time you perfect a new creative hobby, land a new career, or launch your business. Right now during the holidays you're going to be getting a lot of ads like this one. But the thing I love about Skillshare and the reason that I've partnered with them so many times is that they as a product are not about consumption. It's not about clutter or packaging or stuff. This is about you. It's about your passions, your creative spirit and growth, about doing something for yourself for an entire year. The first 1,000 people to use my link down in the description will get one month free of Skillshare. And thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. There's a character that is perhaps the most important one in the entirety of DC Comics. A character that has unfortunately been neglected in the live action films for far too long. It's taken nine years. Ever since the start of the cinematic universe, I've been holding out hope. And I say now, it's finally time. It's time for the hierarchy of power in the DC universe to really change. We cut to the abandoned Kryptonian ship that serves as Superman's Fortress of Solitude, one of its halls filled with the stasis chamber of the previous crew. Mysteriously, a secret door opens, revealing a new pod with someone inside of it. The pod begins to open, and smoke fills the air, and into the light steps a dog. Woof, 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 woof. Was it worth the wait? Let me know. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you like this video, be sure to like button and subscribe. Special thanks to my friend Eric Azana, who's a great voice actor who helped voice Superman in this role. If you're looking for a voice actor, check him out. He's the best. And of course, special thanks to Alter the Sting, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy Bond, Chicken McDoofus, Connor Langell, Cosmic Tragedy, Iron Ninja, Jonah, Corey's Not Fresh, Lime Spice XL, Logan Triplet Films, Tim Newfeld, Troy Says Buy Erasure is Gay, Tyler Goodrich, Yush Kapoor, Zachary Stonebreaker, Zero to Hero 148, and ZZ Toasty for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. 
on. This has been Troybo17 coming at you live. Whatever's going on, you got this. I believe in you. Be responsible, everybody, and I will see you around.